So I want to share a little bit of news that was kind of a news to me. Um, it was, I think it was March 10th. That's a Tuesday. Uh, Tuesdays are a busy day in the office. The interns are all there, the, um, some of the staff's there, and uh, we're reviewing the week prior. We're making plans for the week ahead. Uh, we have a meal together for lunch. Um, maybe 12, 13 people gathered around a table. One of the interns cooks. Uh, they have a budget, they have a calorie limit, a financial budget, and a time limit in order to prepare and clean up. So what can you do with like 25 bucks serving 12 people, you got 30 minutes, and the calories can't be that high, but everybody wants to be full. <laughs> Welcome to spaghetti. <laughs> It's not that they don't have imagination, There's, you know, gotta fit all those constraints. So anyway, it was a Tuesday, and I remember I was praying in my room, and I just wanna sh share this, this is the word. Uh, you know, we have the inward witness, where the Lord leads us according to our witness. He just, is, we refer to it as a conscience sometimes, but it's kind of that knowing. Yep, I should do that, nope, I'm uncomfortable, I'm not gonna do that. That's the number one way the Lord leads his people. Uh, the Holy Spirit is like uh, referred to as an umpire, making the call. Don't do it, do do it, wait, go fast, go slow, that witness. We all have it. We just need to get our ears tuned to hear it. There's another way God communicates and has been referred to as the inner voice. And it's a voice, it sounds like you because it's really your spirit being activated by the Holy Spirit and it, and it speaks things that you weren't thinking about or leaning in that direction, but the word of the Lord comes. That's another way the Lord speaks to us. Uh, uh, an additional way is the Lord just speaks. The, he talks audibly and you hear it and you're like, well, that was from outside and I'm not sure where it came from, but it looks like it was over here or sounds like it was over there. Well, anyway, on that Tuesday, I had the Lord speak to me in the inner voice. So it was that voice that it was a strong, had authority behind it. It was very uh, authoritative, I guess I would say. It wasn't me, but it wasn't, nobody else in the room would have heard it, but I couldn't help from hearing. And here's what the Lord said. It's time for Jeremiah and Susie to step into the senior leader role of Chapel Valley I have appointed for them. I'm like, what? <laughs> well, actually, what I said, well, when is this to take place? And then the Lord replied, same inner voice, September 13th of this year. September 13th of this year. So then I realized September 13th is actually the anniversary of the church. The church will be 34 years old, September 13th. It's also the anniversary of Kim's and my appointment as the senior leaders. This will be our 23rd anniversary, this September 13th. September 13th has landed on a Sunday like three times. And it just so happens that it's a Sunday. It's also the little 29, the last day of the Jewish year before the Shemitah year, the, everything hits the fan and <laughs> welcome to the senior leadership ministry. <laughs> Stock market collapses. No. So, um, but I want to share, I want to, so I'll go through the quick process of what I, what I did with all that, because that was pretty prominent. I'd mentioned before, and I don't think this is the case, but I actually thought it might be fired by the Lord. Like, because you, you know, you, once you start measuring your life, you're like, I could have done a lot better. Could always pray more, could always study more, could always be more pastoral. There's always a lot more to do. And uh, we do ask the questions often, but Lord, how am I doing? I'd like to have that conversation. The Lord's gracious. So I didn't know for sure, and I was a little taken back by it, a little um, not weepy, but like, huh. So anyway, I thought, well, I'm gonna, I pondered the timeline. If I'm here now, and this is when a transition should formally take place, what happens between now and then? And I had the brilliant idea that I should talk to my wife. <laughs> yeah, you learn something after a while. So anyway, Kim comes home and um, you, you could come up, sweetie. And uh, I, I shared with her this and then, can we use this mic? Yes. 
and then she's going to share just real quick how she processed processed it well um i had actually up well, in february at the end of february i along with quite a few uh leaders here from the church women went up to our our women's conference up in rhinelander and that was february 27th and there was a a moment in time where they always have you break away, you know, to hear from the Lord for yourself. Not just listen to what the pastors, what the teachers say, um, but just really to set your side, yourself, set aside a time to actually hear from the Lord. And uh, the Lord kept saying throughout the whole conference, for me, I don't know what, what you all heard, uh, but what I heard for me is, are you willing to give me everything? And um, I'm just like, oh, well, what does that mean? You know, you ask, start asking questions. What does that mean? Does it like mean? Does everything mean everything? Yeah, does everything mean everything? Um, or most things. Yeah. And uh, the Lord shared with me a couple of, a couple of scriptures. And um, one, one primarily is a scripture that I used to say to Jeremiah. I used to prophesy this over you all the time. And um, it's Jeremiah 29, and it says, For I know the plans that I have for you. They are to bring hope, and I have a hope for you, and I have a future for you. And then the Lord, the Lord went on to say, I mean, I wrote everything down that he gave me. And um, he's, he's basically, you, your time it, as lead pastors at Chapel Valley is coming to a close. And I'm asking the Lord, okay, you know, I like, I'm, I'm a planner, so I'm like, okay, so is that two years? Is that what? And in my journal here, I wrote like, within five years is what I wrote. And because, um, you know, I like to think ahead, I like to plan ahead. But I find it really interesting that the Lord shared that with me at the end of February, and he didn't tell Tim until almost mid-March um, in, in his bedroom separately we had not talked at all and so i just kept the word that the that the lord gave me and i just kept it to myself and i'm just like okay lord whenever the time is right you're going to share it to share it with him and then i will know that this this is of you um and so that that's exactly how it took place and um let me just read in first corinthians chapter 9 verse 24. Tim mentioned that that uh, the the verse in Hebrews. That's one of my favorite verses because even though I may not look like I'm a runner, in my head and in my spirit, I am a runner and I'm a racer. And um, it says in First Corinthians nine verse twenty four. It says, "Do you not know that in a race all the runners win, but only one receives the prize?" And he said, "So to receive the prize." You have to run that you can obtain it. And so I was like, okay, Lord, I'm running. I don't know where I'm running, and I, I still don't know where I'm running. But, Lord, I'm running because I am running after you. You are the one that I run to. You are the one that I am passionately following. And so if you want me to give up everything, I am willing to give up everything. At first I thought maybe he's calling us into the mission field. But, and if that's what he wants to do, I'm, I'm willing to do it because I'm following him. I'm a pursuer of him. I'm not a pursuer of anything else. I'm a pursuer of him. So am I willing to give him everything? And the answer is yes. Thank you. If, is it, if that's all you want to share. Okay. <laughs> um. What a courageous woman. It's awesome. Two years ago, three years ago, I still think it was two years ago, we went down at a convention that we had. We went down, we put our lives on the altar. And I make it sound like, oh, we finally did that. I mean, we're, we're always willing to do that. But we really did go forward and just say, Lord, we're willing to do whatever you want us to do. We want to just live that way, open-handed and whatever you want to do. It's more, more exciting that way. And uh, we had a guy come up. I know him. He works in the missions department in Foursquare and tried to recruit us to go to the Ukraine. 
I'm like, no, no, we're not signing up for missions yet. We're just putting our life on the altar. <laughs> he goes, well, let me know when you're ready. <laughs> um, so after I shared that with Kim and she said, well, the Lord prepared her, thought the timeline was a little quick, but other than that, the Lord had prepared her. Uh, we met, I met with Jay and Susie because again, this really wasn't the Lord asking us to resign. He was asking us to get out of the place so that Jay and Susie can take the role that the Lord has prepared them and this church for at this season of time. And I think that that's really important. I think the Lord in his wisdom is always ahead of what's needed. And so there's a reason for that. I have my personal uh, suspicions, but they're not necessarily revelations. So I met with Jay and Susie, and um, they were not waiting for this conversation. They didn't anticipate this conversation. It was a surprise to them. I think they felt like they were kind of in their groove and they were good. They knew the Lord has more for them, but at the same time, they weren't antsy or uncomfortable with where the Lord had. So I asked them, is this bear witness with you? Please pray about it and go home and talk it over and stuff. And so then they came back and felt that it was the timing of the Lord and that this was going to, this was the will of God. And again, they felt like the timeline was like the Lord had picked it, but it wasn't one we would have picked. A lot of transitions maybe take a couple of years. So anyway, after we had that conversation, then I called our district supervisor, Dan Munt, because then I needed to say, so now how do we put this in a situation where it doesn't look, and they don't want this, I don't want this, nobody wants this, where it doesn't look like the pastor's son and daughter-in-law get the nod because they're the pastor's son and daughter-in-law. So I told Dan that that was important for us. I said, I want you to vet out this process. I want them to be able to stand and say that this was the Lord, not opportunity that, to take over a family business or something like that. And so Dan thought that that was important. He then scheduled a meeting with the church council. And um, I guess I'll have Laura come up and just quickly share from that perspective uh, how it went with Dan and and so the whole council was there, and I just knew Laura would be here today, so what was your spin on that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, Tim came to us, and we then did have a meeting with Dan Munt, and it was um, the district supervisor, and it was just us, Tim and Jay weren't at the meeting. Um, and he just he asked us how we felt about it, and you know what our opinion was, and we said that it, it was a surprise to us, much as it was to Tim and Jay and Susie and Kim, and, um, but that we had um, no doubt in our mind that it was of the Lord and that Jay and Susie were ready to step into this position and um, that they were the right people for the job. So we had that conversation with Dan um, and we asked him questions about, you know, how, how does this work? And he gave us kind of the scoop on how it works with Enforcer, is that, you know, Tim had went and talked to him about it and then um, Dan interviewed both Pastor Tim and Kim and Pastors Jay and Susie um, as the successors. Successor, thank you. Um, <laughs> and so that he was having those interviews and he was feeling that it really wasn't the Lord as well as he was having all of these meetings. Um, and that the next step then was to come and let obviously let the congregation know about the transition that's coming so that um, if there are questions that you guys have, we want to make sure, the one thing that we said as a council was we wanted to make sure that everybody felt comfortable and that everybody knew that the communication lines were open and that you, if you do have questions or concerns about any of it at any time, you can come to us as the council, Pastor James, Susie, Pastor Tim, and Kim, that um, all doors of communication are open and that um, we want to make this as easy a transition as possible and that everybody really does feel that it's from the Lord and we're excited for the things that are going to come to everybody through this. Amen. Good, thank you. You guys ready? Come on up. Um, I did meet after I met with Kim and then Jay and Susie, then my family got together and we shared that, shared it with the family at Jeremiah's birthday dinner. <laughs> and then um, that's the only thing I think I've left out. but. I just want them to share a little bit of their perspective and then I'm just gonna 
kind of answer questions that I think, like what, what, what's the future for Chapel Valley? What's the future for these two? What's the future for us? Yeah, as he's mentioned, or we keep reiterating, is really the um, by surprise that we've been taken. Um, as he mentioned, Jay and I were not um, ever contending for this. I believe that we actually had a conversation. It was it was about five years ago. I remember distinctly we were at Roman Candle, and Pastor Tim was trying to talk about what is a five year plan, what does a ten year plan look like. And Jay and I just changed the subject, and we ordered our food, and that was it. We never <laughs> continued on the conversation. We just left it there. Um, we, for about um, the past year, have known that maybe a year and a half that transition has been coming. We didn't know it would be in this capacity. Um, last summer, as we were driving home from uh, California, I felt like it was time for me to hand completely Luma over to, to Pastor David. I didn't know why. I didn't know what that would mean. I didn't. There was there was nothing about it that made sense, um, other than okay, so so let's do this. I, again, there wasn't a plan a B for me. Um, and for me personally, I, I believe that that really was a, um, a time for, and it has been a time that the Lord has really been um, shaping and molding and refining me personally. Um, there's stuff he's doing in us, but as from this component, um, there was, there's been things that he's been bringing to attention and just kind of, we've, we have both felt just kind of under a, a different pressure. Um, and some days, and honestly, it's felt like, how do we keep our head above water? Um, but just knowing that God has been good, he has been faithful. Um, I feel like every time that there's been something that has um, been an exuberant amount of pressure um, uh, or whatever, that the Lord is continually reminding me, um, like, you're, you're not alone. Um, and really just bringing us through an interesting process of what that will look like for us. And so um, we were very much surprised. I think he told us right before I was on my way, I was going to California by myself. Um, and so I had a plane ride all by myself about just kind of thinking and processing what was going on. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, you know, the, the message that Pastor Tim was just giving prior, just, just a few moments ago, is uh, really has been kind of a, an anthem for me, I would say, probably for the last five years of, of my life since that conversation. And what I didn't recognize is that the Lord was working things in us. Looking back, it's 2020, right? But I didn't realize that the Lord was establishing things in both Susie and myself um, through those testings and those trials and the uncomfortableness. And people are, are always like, how do you do all this? And I'm like, it's the grace of the Lord. Like, it's not, it's not us. We are just taking it one step at a time, and we are just doing what God has asked us to do and being faithful in those things. And so I often tell our interns, I'm like, listen, if, if you can leave here and number one, hear the voice of the Lord, and number two, hold your feet to the fire when it gets uncomfortable, because it will, and you don't bail out, I did my job. If you can do those two things, you're good. You can do anything. And so those are the things that we try to establish. Obviously, there's personality things. There's growing up issues. Yeah, that's all That's all secondary to me. If I can get you to do those two things, you're going to be just fine. And so and I believe that the Lord was establishing those things in us and that we were walking through some trials, tribulations, uh, uncomfortableness and that the Lord was growing and establishing things in us and so when this happened it was it was a shock we were like what on earth like uh, my mouth dropped I didn't say anything I think for five minutes I'm like what is happening is this for real like is this real life I was like what day is it it was March and so I'm like is it April I'm like what's going on and so what we prayed about it and it was really evident to us and it's been evident to the people that are our mentors and people that pour into us they're like well of course like how did you not see this how did you not see this coming and so so we are moving forward as we feel the Lord is leading leading us and and I am I don't think there's most transitions pastoral church transitions do not happen like this where a pastor says this is the time this is the race, and I'm handing the baton in full stride. It is almost always a disaster. It is almost always, uh, uh, there's, there's tension, there's splits, there's a lot of emotions, and the pastors don't get out of the way, or the next person is being way too ambitious. And I am extremely humbled and inspired just by the open hands that my parents, Pastor Tim and Pastor Kim, have exemplified. That they are really living life we don't know what's next and that being said they're not looking for uh, they're they're waiting on the lord they're not looking for a million opportunities here 
because they can get it. Um, they're amazing people, but they are living life open hand. They're saying, Lord, what do you want to do? What are you doing right now? Okay, I'm trusting you, and we're moving forward in obedience and faithfulness. And so I was incredibly humbled, humbled and inspired uh, by this. By this. Yeah, and uh, also one last thing. I think that early on after he talked to us, and I was getting ready one Sunday, and I actually felt like the Lord had uh, just showed me that what we were receiving was, that was their inheritance. Uh, that it was very much not, I think I came and I was like, hey, you're not getting fired. I, I just was like, you, we're getting your inheritance, your lifelong, their lifelong um, work of pursuing the Lord. And that's more than any, like by any financial inheritance, that's way greater. And so we understand um, the cost in which, and probably obviously not to the full capacity, but we understand the cost in which it's cost them. And um, we know that the fruit that we will see is not because of what we've done, but that it'll be a direct inheritance and reaping of everything that they've sown, that they've plowed, that they've tilled, that they've, that they've been on their knees for. Um, and so that in itself, we are humble because sometimes we look and like, why us? Um, but we recognize that this is very much their inheritance. And, um, and like Jay is saying, and what an honor it is to go into this next stage knowing um, what we are receiving. Some people receive a mess from people. Some people receive churches that are a mess, that have wrecked things spiritually, um, emotionally, and we know that what we are inheriting is health and that we are to move forward in a way that will look very different than them, um, but that will very much reap the benefits and everything that they have sown, that we will begin to, to go full force into the, into the field and begin to reap that harvest. And so that's what we, um, that's where we're at with things, so. Great. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to share a few things, thoughts, and obviously we got a couple months to work work this out. We we didn't make any decisions beyond this until we got this out. Uh, staff considerations, things like that. Um, but so let me just share a couple of things to encourage all of us in this. So my. My question would be, what does the future hold for Chapel Valley, Jeremiah and Susie, and Tim and Kim? So if you got your newsletter this week, we had two words in there. One was from Leela, one was from Shane Jackson, who was here a couple of weeks ago. And Leela's word, I'm going to summarize it. I would love for you to refresh your memory by going to the newsletter and reading it. But the idea I got out of that is that we are to awaken, get engaged, and renew our hope for God has strategically placed us, you and us, that we are here with great purpose. Um, and then uh, Shane's word was that uh, Chapel Valley and the greater Madison area will, I, this is again my summary, but we will touch each other, that we're not disconnected from the city and the city isn't disconnected from us, though it may appear that way right now, the greater city. I really think the Lord does have something significant to do through this church, not solely through this church, but but still in part through this church. I feel I know part of the adversary that's out there. Uh, the Lord showed me that Acts 19, the first half of Acts 19 is, is what we're up against, and it's the strategy that we're to use as well. So you can go and read that and refresh yourself with it. Last week, Steve Cecil was here and he shared about how when he transitioned out of his church that he was concerned about it and the Lord basically said, they're, they're in my hands, the great shepherd's hands and, and, and the journey is doing quite well now. I think by Steve's own words, he would say they're doing better than they were when he was there. And so we're gonna trust him. And then Jeremiah and I had a dream. We had the same dream separate from one another and then we talked about it and it was really pretty interesting but it was really the dynamic uh, ministry that was ongoing in the church here and um, we're already seeing the first fruits of that trickle in but nothing compared to what our dream reflected I still believe that's the future and that's where it's headed and so uh, great days are ahead uh, Jeremiah and Susie what's in store for them in my opinion so we're in a transition lane that's in a relay race and if you're familiar with the relay race you've seen them in high school or something you have this this part of the lane where both of you can occupy it 
Only one can enter. You both can be in it. The baton needs to be passed before you get to the end of the lane because then only one can exit it. So it's that transition part. A sprinter reaches their full speed in about 12 yards. If you're running a 100-yard race, a sprinter reaches full speed in 12 yards, and then their speed literally is slowing down all the way to the finish line. It's just that's just the nature of it. So who slows down the least usually wins that race. Like your last 10 yards are your slowest 10 yards in a 100-yard race, even though it may look like you're going faster or you feel more fluid, you've reached your peak. So in this transition, I'm at the point where I'm probably going my slowest in the race and they're about ready to go their fastest and we want to make a good clean transition in this time because that's the nature of a race. Now the Lord's going to put us on another path. I think we'll get renewed energy for that race. But in this sense, I already can tell that I am not as fresh or as crisp. And it's not because of fatigue. It's because the Lord is transitioning. There's, there's a greater clarity working in their hearts and minds than there are in Kim's, my heart and mind, concerning the church. That's a transition. It's not because we're failing. It's because the Lord is letting us let go right. while they are embracing what's happening. Mm -hmm. So we're already going to be seeing for the next two months decisions that I will have them make because they're going to live with those decisions. Mm -hmm. And so there's the transition. We're in that lane. But there's things that I want to finish, too. Uh, there's things I want to conclude strong. I want to finish well. We want to, we want, I want some decisions made. I'm pressing the Lord on some things because the truth is we've entered the lane, but I'm the one that's in possession of the baton at this point. Right. Even though the hand's back and I'm reaching forward, and there's going to be a time where we'll both have it, and then away it goes. So... Um, I, one of the, some of the things I want to impart is I want to help them put on the senior leadership mantle. It's already on, but just to what are the dynamics, what to caution against, uh, decisions that they'll make. To, we'll do those together, but I want them to come to their own conclusion, where that, get comfortable in their own metal, so to speak. Um, I believe that we should build momentum and when they exit that transition lane, they're at full speed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That they don't get full speed starting September 13th, they can hit September 13th in full stride. Right. That's something we can do. And then um, they're different than Kim and I. I am a facilitator. I was describing myself to my supervisor and I said, well, let me just tell you who I am. I'm a facilitator. I facilitate people blossoming. I facilitate them becoming a success. My heart is for them to succeed. Even if it costs me, I want them to look good because I feel that I look good. That's just the way I've been working. Um, it's not that Jay and Susie aren't facilitators, but they're stronger leaders than Kim and I are. And we're coming into a season where we're gonna need that. And so it's not a shame to be who I am and to not be the right fit. There's another right place for Kim and I. Right. But we're in a season where we need to have what they have leading this congregation. And, then, and that's a good thing. And I'm thankful that I got to be a part of their training, their lives, their mentoring. And I'm glad that the Lord worked this out. And they were vetted out. You know, they got a camera. We've got all this going on. This was all a product of their labors, right? ELN, OSL, the ministries that are making disciples, raising up young leaders, um, the children's ministry that's taking place, the nursery, all that is a product of their leadership already. Mm -hmm. So they've already been vetted out. They haven't been coasting. They're not living in my shadow. They are out on the front. Uh, it's not like I'm living in their shadow. I just either... But at the same time, they're doing a lot. And the Lord has allowed that because the Lord has been actually speaking to Kim and I about some other things that, and I feel like the Lord has been putting a message in us that is not, is that would not be endured by a, congreg a single congregation for a very long time. So if you take some itinerant ministry out there that's really powerful, he comes in, visits the church, and for, you have 10 meetings and your life has changed. 
that person probably needs to get going now so you can get back to allowing that to be transformed into your life while you're then continuing as a congregation and serving your community. If that person planted themselves there and stayed there, you're gonna get one flavor of ice cream and pretty soon you're gonna throw up on it. So I suspect that the time is coming that the Lord is giving us more of a single flavor for a reason. And I want to really work that and find out what the Lord has in store for us as well. Um, so they're different, and I'm looking forward to that. Kim and I, the Lord is dealing with us with a two-edged sword. It, would, it, there's, it doesn't surprise me that the Lord said, I want Jay and Susie to make room for them in the leadership role. I want it done by September 13th and never mention what he wants us to do. <laughs> one I'm glad that he gave me the chance and that my courageous wife joined me in stride to say yes to the Lord without knowing what else is going yes. we're not we're not going to be on the payroll so it's it's one of those things where it's like we are we are done I don't think we're going to be divorced from the congregation by any means uh, that I just don't see that at all that we are, but we are in a, in a sense, we're done. The plan is when September 13th comes, the next week is men's retreat. So I still want to go to that. I'm still a man. <laughs> yeah, and then, I, then the week after that is my niece's wedding. So we'll be, but, the, but then after that, I suspect that I, I want us to be able to get some distance and regroup. And so we're not gonna be around I'm not changing my phone number, but I'm not going to answer it if you call. <laughs> and then we'll see. And I think by the time we get to September 13th, I can, I'll be able to more define what our role will be or who we will be. But you, you, need, you will learn. You'll know. I'll know. Life can go on without Kim and I. And, uh, and however the Lord wants to weave us in the tapestry of this church in the future is up to him. And, uh, but I know that there's something that the Lord wants us to do as well. When we first got married, we had a vision of what our ministry life would look like. And it's possible that that can be starting to come to pass. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we will see. Um, the two, I say it's a two-edged sword because one, the, the Lord needed to cut like he did because it was an opportunity for us to give him the best offering we could. That is our life's work into his hands without the, the carnal security of knowing what's next. And I'm grateful that he didn't take that away from me. He allowed me to give it to him. This is the only life you get to make sacrifices like that. And I was thrilled that we get to make that because you're our best gift. The other one is, and I know this is true, and I had this revelation when I was speaking at the youth camp. One of the things I talked about when Jesus increased in in wisdom and in stature and in favor in the eyes of man and God, Luke 2.52, that word increase is hammered out. It's like taking a block of steel, you put it in the furnace, and when it gets red hot, you hammer it into the instrument you want it to be. Jesus surrendered by submitting himself to his parents, says he was subject to them from that time on. He entered the process of being hammered out until he could be the instrument the Lord needed him to be. And the idea that he increased in stature is not that he just got older, the infrastructure was fortified within him so he could carry the fullness of deity in his life. And so the Lord is hammering all of us out. That's the whole thing of the Hebrews that we just read in chapter 12. He's hammering us out so that we can be fortified and then carry the weight of his presence. That's what sons and daughters do. He gives you the keys to the business and says, now go do business. And I felt like the Lord saying, I have amazing things in store for you and you will not know them until you come up and spend time with me. So I shared the bed bug story, you know, I told you that we had bed bugs and everybody knows that hideous pestilence story <laughs> and uh, could get no relief. And when, when the Lord spoke to me and said, I don't have a bed bug problem, you have a bed bug problem. 
Now, you know, I've done the Psalm 91 on every door frame, made everybody hit the papers. You go into the door, claim Psalm 91, you know, they'll care by night, we'll be doing your thing and all that stuff. Well, it wasn't working. And, um, because it was a technique and it wasn't working. So I fasted and I prayed and I'm like in torment and I'm crying out to the Lord. And here's what I was doing. I was saying, Lord, if you don't come down into my world and deal with this, I don't know what I'm going to do. And the, and the Lord basically said, it doesn't get dealt with that way. If you don't come up into my world and deal with it, it's never going to happen. So he said, I don't have a bed bug problem. You do. So you need to come up here where we don't have bed bug problems and deal with it. And when I caught that, I went and prayed at the foot of my bed and cast out every vermin and past yeah. ants, bed bugs, chipmunks, and mice. And the next day, they're all gone. Just all gone. And, and that's what the Lord is saying here. If you come up, we can talk about your future. If you think I'm coming down there, I don't have conversations down there. I've given you a place in heaven. Come take your seat and let's talk. So that's where we're at. And it's, I call it a double-edged sword because the Lord is saying, I will tell you everything you need to know when you come up here and talk with me. So that's where we're at. And, I, and the reason I think that's important is because he's saying, that's how everything in your future is going to function. So you learn to take, be comfortable in your seat in heaven. And when you are, then you're going to do, you'll, all the answers will be there. But don't give, give me this woe is me down in the earth stuff. <laughs> that's not where I live. All right. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. And then all the promises that the Lord has put in our hearts, the things that I've said to you, they may be old, they may be young. You know, Zachariah, when they, they gave birth to John the Baptist, Okay, so John the Baptist's parents, when they were young, prayed for a child. And then they went many, many years and didn't have a child. And then the angel comes to them and says, I've come to answer your prayer. No, the moment you prayed, your prayer was heard. So God had already determined when they prayed, how, what was going to happen. You're going to bring forth the voice in the wilderness who will pave the way for the Messiah. We, as soon as you prayed, we determined that's what we're going to do. You just didn't know it was going to be 50 years later. <laughs> but I chose you to be the one that would bring forth John the Baptist. Amen. Well, there's many prayers we have prayed and, and our heart's desire that we have longed for that the Lord determined how he would answer them when you prayed them. But now years have to pass in order for the timing to be right. right. So we just live with that. So that's, I feel that we're in that place now where some of the old stuff's going to come back. And so I say our future is glorious, but pending, pending upon whether we get to the Lord and talk to him about what he has in store. And I know he has great things. So I'm kind of going to leave it at that. And um, I know this kind of caught you off guard. I'm, I'm amazed that this didn't leak out. But I shouldn't be trusted leaders at all. Um, it's like my birthday, surprise birthday. Never saw it coming. I was supernaturally blinded by it. And I feel the Lord just kept this a secret as well. But it's not, it, this is good news. This is, I'm very excited. I'm excited for the church. I just think it's really going to get a whole new traction. Um, again, I'm still hands on and I still want things to finish well. I don't know what we're going to do exactly. I know we'll be well, and the Lord will care for us, and he'll care for you. And now we got two months to talk about it and to work it out, okay? So we don't, we don't have to make all our decisions today. I'm not going anywhere. I still got some things I want to say. And uh, maybe in the future, the senior pastors invite us to come back and share. We can do that. And I'm not counting on it. <laughs> Well, I would like to pray, if I may. And then we're gonna close in a song? Yeah. Oh, we got a video. Let's do that first. We have a video. This is our district supervisor who said he wanted to share a word. Good morning. It's my privilege to join with you via this video this morning. And uh, as you're already aware, Pastor Tim and Kim are stepping aside uh, from being the lead pastor of the church and turning it over to Jay and Susie and um, couldn't be more happy for Jay and Susie and more confident in their leadership skills and ability and the call that God has on their life, the competency that I've seen over and over again. 
Uh, I also wanted to honor Pastor Tim and Kim. This this kind of thing doesn't happen very often, uh, where a pastor says, you know, we need to step aside for the next generation. And I know uh, you guys are taking quite a sacrifice to step aside, and I honor you today. You're certainly not done in ministry by any means, but this is a new chapter in your life that you'll be opening in just about a month from now, month and a half. So wanted to, again, give my endorsement to Jay and Susie. I think you guys are going to lead so well, and I couldn't be more proud of you and happy and also honor uh, Pastor Tim and Kim today. Thank you for leading well. Thank you for finishing this chapter well. And it's time to turn a new page into a new chapter of your life, and I'm excited for that too. So God bless you. Uh, love you all. We'll see you September 13th for the installation. Thanks. Yeah, the, uh, the, the structure of Foursquare is a pastor is appointed by the district supervisor, but the district supervisor wouldn't appoint somebody if the congregation said, no way, you're not, we're, we won't go there anymore if these people are pastors. But it still is an appointment system. But I, I do want you to feel if you have something you want to be heard, you can tell me or Kim or the council for sure, if you uh, feel the process isn't working itself out, like you're not included enough, um, we just began it. You have to announce it sooner or later, and then you just then you start. So we just had to do the proper process of talking with the right people, and we're beginning now. And uh, I think it'll be wonderful. I'm excited. Trina? Oh. Um, no, no. <laughs> we didn't get a very encouraging word on the property. And uh, so we're still, that's kind of, uh, we're still asking the Lord how aggressive we should be on that. Uh, we're looking at property, the old Nedrobos on Verona Road. Uh, the city is pretty dismissive of us buying that. It's a part of a TIF program, the state's involved with the zoning, so you literally would have to take on the state and then the city, and and, the, and it's not that we couldn't do that. The owner is like, well, I mean, I have people who want to buy this property, and he, want, he wants to be out by the end of the year, so he, you know, it'd be easy for him. So if the Lord says, yep, I'm willing to battle with you, then we would probably have a much better chance. I'm not sure that he wants to wait on that, I don't know. We could always buy the property and then spend years trying to get occupying it. But don't know if we want to do that either. I say we take all our building funds, either put it on black on the roulette wheel or <laughs> double our money. <laughs> Why not? Hey. <laughs> That's right. I don't have to live with it. <laughs> I actually did that once where um, I thought, okay, this is going to be like that. And I said, I'm putting it all on black, and it landed on red. So I'm not, the Lord's not allowed me to be lucky because he doesn't want me to build my future like that. <laughs> all right. Well, Father, we just give you thanks, and I give you thanks for the, the heart of Chapel Valley, the heart of this people. Lord, I just know that um, heaven and earth are different because of the faithfulness, the prayers, the energy, the determination, the what we'll call spiritual warfare in the proper sense. That there's not been a passivity, there's been earnest supplication to advance the kingdom of God, there's been intercession to unlock the captives. There's been a faithful word that has gone to uh, allow the word to prevail and to push back on the strongholds of the adversary in people's lives, that these things are continuing, <coughs> that even in camp, Jay and Susie, as they directed these two camps, handled the budget, did all the labor force to do all the events and demonstrated their ability to lead and guide that, and that even there, Lord, people were delivered, saved, set free, filled with your Holy Spirit. Good things happened. 
Even leaders, pastors were impacted by that. Lord, I just thank you that by some measurements, maybe it doesn't look that noticeable, but I know you notice. And I know that you count it faithful and that you're gonna add and multiply to the fruits of this congregation. And Lord, I do pray and I don't overlook, I just pray that in this time now of transition that you would allow your grace to be abundantly present upon us. That we would, uh, Lord, it's the most dangerous part of a race really is that baton passing. And once it hits the ground, it's over or it's, the stride is broken or a lane is compromised, that that race ends up being nullified. And Lord, I know that that's only a metaphor, but I do pray, Lord, that while we're in this transition time, you would allow it to go, not just smoothly, but gain momentum, that it would be an explosive, awesome time. And that, Lord, uh, you would allow us to get comfortable in what will be our new skin, so to speak. And um, I just pray that whatever things can be concluded that I feel are pending on my part that I want to see resolution on. Lord, I pray that you would grant that. I pray that uh, new things that are opening up, that you would give new vision and new sight to us. And then I pray, Lord, that all of us would find that we can continue on and that these are great times and opportunities for the kingdom people to make the most of. And I pray that we would do that. So I thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for what you're doing in each of our lives. Continue it until your return. In Jesus' name, amen.